And we are live and ready to go. All right. Dr. Evan Anton, thank you so much for doing the show, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Oh, my gosh. And you have a dog with you, too. This is great. <laughs> who, who do my we... guy, he, just, he likes just hanging out, so I'll probably just sit around for the, for the entirety of the podcast here. <laughs> yeah. No worries. What's his name? Henry. Henry. I like the name. Nice to rest him. Oh, yeah. my gosh, Henry. I... Dude, he's a sweet guy, though. Yeah, I have a pit bull that would probably eat him, so we're going to leave her out. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I'll put some dog, so. Yeah, well, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, we've had vets on the show before, but uh, no one that's looked like you. So, sorry, Dr. Koob. <laughs> So I, I just want to get into your backstory and just, you know, how you got into this profession and then kind of get into, I know, you know, you have, you have your Animal Planet show, but take me from the beginning. Um, I mean, I've, I've kind of always had a passion for animals and wildlife. So I grew up in Kansas, just outside of Kansas City, and we had a creek in our backyard. It was like a suburban neighborhood. And I mean, my first memories are just literally going around the yard, going in the creek, you know, looking for frogs and snakes and turtles and, you know, crawdads. And, you know, my mom was, um, she's been in landscape designing my entire life. And so we had neat little rock gardens and little ponds and areas. And so I'd go flip those rocks and look for cool insects or snakes or whatnot. And, you know, honestly, things haven't changed that much. Now I just, instead of doing it in my backyard, I, I do it around the world and love looking for wildlife and working with them. And, you know, I've, I, I realized, you know, especially in, in – uh, I didn't know I wanted to be a vet until college. You know, I, I always loved animals. I knew they'd be a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know it'd be with, whether it'd be professionally or not. Um, and then in college, I was like, you know, I, I, I've always had an appreciation for, for medicine, and I think surgery is fascinating, and I love animals. Like, this is – I think this is kind of my calling. And so I just pursued getting into vet school, um, you know, in every way that I could from that point moving forward. And – uh yeah, I just love it, man. You know, I just, I honestly, I just wanted to give back to the wildlife I've appreciated so much over the years. So I love working with them. I've always had dogs and cats, like my guy here, you know, and, and, uh, you know, so I love being able to help, help our pets and, you know, help, you know, people that have, that also share the human animal bond with, with the animal as well. And it's just kind of taken off from there. Yeah, so we have a lot of young listeners who maybe want to pursue a career, you know, becoming a veterinarian. How long is that process? Um, you know, in general, these days, it's, you know, once you graduate high school, uh, you used, I think you used to need to have a bachelor's degree, and now you don't. I might have that backwards. I don't know. But usually, it's three to four years of, of undergrad kind of coursework and a lot of prerequisites, a lot of, you know, chemistry and physics and science and biology courses on top of other stuff, too. Um, but those are some of the big ones. Um, and then, you know, they, they want to, you know, vet schools want to see good experience. So you do that kind of thing. You can try to do that while you're in school. And then vet school itself is another four years. Wow. So after, I mean, for most vets, you know, that are just general practitioners, I technically would be called a general practitioner. Now I do work with small animals and exotics and, and wildlife as well. Um, but that's, that's just to graduate vet school. Now, say you want to be a specialist and you really like, uh, surgery. Then you need to do a, at least a year of an internship. These days, often you also need to do a surgical internship, and those are each a year. And then you do another three years of residency. So that's another five years on top of the eight years, seven, eight years after college. So it, it really varies. And then some surgeons specialize even further than that. I mean, I have friends that are you know board certified in neurology and surgery, and so these guys are you know specialized neurosurgeons. And these, I mean, they've they've done a ton of education. And they're really bright. I mean, they're on another level. I couldn't even do what they do. I couldn't even hang in the school. I mean, it's just intense. But it's really neat work. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the sky's the limit. You can keep you can keep learning after that. But in general, eight years. Eight years. Okay. And so, how long have you been a vet? I graduated in 2013, so about six and a half years. I graduated in May. Okay. Yeah. And so, how did you become? People Magazine named you the sexiest vet. So take me from. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, have you always known you were good looking or like, what, how does this work? Like, did you go through school and were people like, oh, you know what I mean? I mean, were people making comments or how does this, how does this whole thing come about? Um, they approached me initially in 2014. Okay. And they wanted me to be in the, in that, that issue of the magazine. Um, and it was a section called men at work. 
Uh, and so there was like maybe eight or eight or so other dudes. And, you know, one was a teacher. He was on the same page as me. Another guy was a chef. Another guy was actually a model. And it was just like, these are the sexiest whatever in their profession, according to People Magazine. Um, so at first I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, that's that's a huge compliment. Like, obviously, I'm flattered. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, but I thought, you know what? You know, it's fun. It's funny. I know I'm going to, you know, my colleagues are going to get a ride, you know, get a ride <laughs> out of it. My friends will, you know, get, you know, think it's pretty funny. And my yeah. family will. Well, my family and my mom and dad are very supportive. They just love it. But, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's just, you know, it was, it was a way for me to just, you know, get, uh, get my message out there. Yeah. And now did they find you through Instagram? Is that how people magazine found you? I, I didn't have a big Instagram following at that time. Just like at that time, maybe a couple few thousand, maybe, probably under 5,000. Um, I had some educational YouTube videos, but I wasn't, I didn't have a lot. I mean, I had less than 10,000 subscribers. So, you know, I asked them that, and I never, I never got a, I never got a totally clear answer on how. I think somebody there just knew of me, or, or had a friend that followed me, or something. I, I really, honestly, I'm not sure how that initial relationship started. Wow! And so that was back in 2014, right? Right, right. The and, end of the year. That, that issue usually comes out like around now. Yeah. Okay. November. And then when did things really start taking off? I mean, you are at a clinic in California, correct? Yes, in Thousand Oaks, California, just a little, just just outside of LA, a little bit northwest of LA. Okay. Um, uh, you know, so I always wanted to, um, you know, raise awareness and educate people about animals and wildlife and the veterinary profession, and you know, wildlife, you know, conservation awareness and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, for for a long time, I've been doing YouTube educational videos. You know, I, I've been doing that for uh, shoot since two thousand like six. Oh. So. Okay. Yeah, you know, almost uh, seven or years when I grew up, by the time I graduated vet school, um, and I uh, I ended up getting my first TV show that same year I graduated, 2013, later that summer. Okay. And I had an agent uh, that did a lot of TVs. You know, she did. Uh, she was great, and she did. Uh, she worked with a lot of like people in news, but she had my name on her list, and um, I was on the the Chris Jenner show. She had a, a talk show for a, a couple of seasons, I think. Oh my God. Um, Bert, with uh, one of the one of the other guests was a Real Housewife of Atlanta, and he <laughs> Lee. And so, <laughs> yeah, oh my God. I had, I had, it was hilarious, dude. It was like it was a big segment. I was on for like thirteen minutes. Wow, I was so nervous at first. But we had a kangaroo, um, a brown lemur, a baboon, an alligator, uh, a, a, a camel, and a six. Did I say the alligator? Yeah, yep. and maybe something. Else. Um, yeah. It was awesome, and Nini was afraid of everything. Chris wasn't that far behind her, but it was just it was hysterical. But anyway, so I did some sporadic TV stuff um, from there. You know, every you know probably two to four or five times a year in the next couple of years, and then I kind of went viral on social media in 2016, like the uh, January 29th. I remember I I, I got 10,000 followers. Then I would gradually grown uh, over the course of since graduating vet school, so over, like three years. Okay. I was really excited. I was like, I put a post up. I was like, hey, this is so cool to see, um, you know, 10,000 people, you know, that are like, like animals and, and uh, you know, like the kind of work that, I, that we do as veterinarians and whatnot. You know, I'm just really thankful. And the next morning, I had 15,000. I'm like, I've never grown 5,000 overnight. Like, what's going on? And then I saw that this um, this digital news outlet, Board Panda, uh, did a like a little expose kind of piece on me. Okay. Um, some people forwarded that. And, and I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then when that got out, uh, some other big players reached out, like BuzzFeed and Huffington Post, and some other mag some digital magazines. Um, and then and then it kind of took off. So from over the next like almost two weeks, I grew up to like twenty. I'm sorry, two hundred twenty thousand. Um, and then I had another little viral bump later, uh, but uh, it's just been kind of steady from there. And um, yeah, now it's you know it's over one point one. So 1.3 million. Dude, that's amazing. I'm trying to hit 10K. I need a bump, man. So do I need to take my shirt off or what do I need to do? <laughs> yeah, right? it was have, yeah, it was somewhere for me traveling that I'd like posted on like uh, Facebook, you know, and, and just, I mean, just, you know, meant, you know, not meant to be uh, a viral thing, but it was funny. But uh, apparently that helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so back, I didn't realize you had another show. Do you, what network was that on? That You said in 2013? 
No, I was a guest on a show. So it was a Chris oh, Jenner yes. show. I was like an animal expert guest, just oh. bringing on those, those animals for that one that one second. Okay. Now, I know a lot of my <laughs> listeners want to know, how was Chris Jenner? Was she super nice in person? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't get it. She was filming, I think, two other episodes that day. Uh-huh. So I really didn't get a chance to talk with her outside of that segment. Like, we take commercial breaks. And it was so funny. I remember she was um, – I had this six-foot alligator. And, uh, you know, I was kind of restraining it and just kind of like sitting on its hips and gently restraining its neck. It wasn't, it was a pretty mellow alligator as, mm-hmm. as they often are in captivity. Yeah. Um, and she is up on this like bar stool, like feet up on it, like crouched on it, like, you know, getting as far as away as she can while still being on the set. Nini ran off. Nini was long gone. She was <laughs> off the set. Where she was. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, Chris was like, do, do you, actually like this do you do you like doing this and i'm like <laughs> i live for this like i love this like that actual moment before that commercial break when i was on this alligator and looking up at these cameras and the audience i was like oh my god like i've been wanting to do something like this for years and it happened so that was like extremely exciting but it was it was funny but um no i mean it, to answer your question she was she was very nice that's very cool yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I had a similar experience. I got my start um, when I was 14 on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, which was like 15 years ago. It was crazy. A, a talent scout audition. And Evan, I was like this tall and this big around. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a photo. I swear to God. It's so funny. Uh, but anyway, yeah, uh, um, exercise wasn't important to me back in the day. But I was going to say that I remember having that moment looking out at the audience. Jay was next to me, the cameras. And I thought, holy crap, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I was like, I love this. And so it's been kind of a journey since. But that's really interesting that you felt that. That's a trip, man. That's I mean, that's yeah, you, that's. I can't even imagine going on TV at 14, like props to you and like, you know, Bob Irwin, like, oh, I mean, yeah. what, what, you know, I mean, that's, uh, that would, I don't even know if I could do that. And the, the first time I was on TV, I, was, I, I guess I was your age now, you about 29 or so? Or? I'm 30. Yeah. 30. So yeah. 30. So I was, I graduated vet school. I was 29. Wow. <laughs> that's a little different, but yeah, that's a trip, man. So cool. Yeah. Where did you grow up? I I'm, I'm in Idaho. And okay. yeah, and I, I had all these rescued reptiles, which I still do. So I have like alligators, pythons and tortoises. And my mom wrote in because uh, they were look, they were doing a talent scout audition and I had no idea. And she just wrote in because they were looking for. Oh, right. Terrible. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, they were, yeah. Well, I mean, it's the best thing she ever did, but it was for teenagers with weird or unusual talents. And I got a call the next week and they're like, you're not good for the segment, but why don't we see if we can transition to you and into like a second guest. And then it happened so fast. And, um, I was on with, pay- go ahead. Sorry. That's even better. I mean, you got a spot on the show. You were like there, like what a trip, man. Yeah. I guess who I was on with. So imagine being a freshman in high school. Can you guess who I was on yeah. with? It made, it made me the coolest kid in school for like four years. You want to guess who it was? Right. <laughs> who? Uh, Pamela Anderson. Oh my God, dude! <laughs> Years ago, especially, yeah. No, that's unreal. I know. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. she's a big animal advocate too, so that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. That's funny. Yeah. So anyway, so back <laughs> on to you. Sorry, but yeah, that's really interesting. So you were on Chris Jenner's show, and then, but you're still working at the clinic. Things start taking off. You said in 2016 ish. Yes, uh, with the with the Instagram and social media, and that and that brought so many other opportunities. I mean that. When that took off, I was doing you know more and more TV appearances. I was finding myself uh, myself in uh, you know other other forms of media, magazines, online, doing interviews. I mean, I had international TV shows you know wanting to come just to do segments on uh, on my work at the hospital and everything. And um, yeah, I mean, it was I was loving it. I mean, I still love it. I absolutely love it. It was like the biggest. Um, I mean, it was just uh, just such such good fortune. It's just been it's been amazing for my for me and my career personally. It's been so helpful for me to get my message out there and help raise awareness for wildlife conservation and and show you know the neat stuff that we do in the veterinary field of medicine. You know, so it's it's been cool. Yeah, I think, but you've worked really hard. Like, I mean, yes, you're you know you're grateful, but I mean, since 2006, I didn't realize you were putting up videos. That's that's amazing. I mean, you know what I mean? It didn't. It, I guess from the outside, it looks like this was something overnight, but it's something you've been working at for a really long time. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's it's been it's been a goal for a very long time, you know. And and uh, yeah, it all started in Australia, actually. So I knew I wanted to be a vet, like in 2004. 
And then in 2006, I did a study abroad in Sydney. And I was traveling all over that country, and I did this big road trip uh, at the end. And we had like a, like a month gap between the last day of classes to finals. That's how it is in Australia. Mm -hmm. They give you a lot of time to study and, and everything. Um, and so yeah, I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent a car. I'm going to travel to the other side of the country in Western Australia. And I'm going to, you know, I didn't, I had a kind of a tight budget, but enough to get a car. But I literally, I, I lived in the car and um, had a bunch of canned food and beans and water in the back. And just like, you know, basically did a road trip in the outback by myself for about three weeks. And before I went, I told my mom, I was like, hey, I need you to send out my video camera. And I bought a tripod. And I was like, I'm going to start making educational videos. I want to, I want to, this is like, I, I realized, I don't know, I was always a big Steve Irwin fan and I was in Australia and I was so inspired by that. And I think, you know, in many ways he's, he's one of the biggest names in wildlife conservation because he's, you know, gotten wildlife to the hearts and homes of millions of people uh, over the decades and still does, you know, even after his passing, which is amazing. And his family is continuing that legacy and doing an incredible job. Um, but I was so inspired. So I started making these educational videos and I caught my first, uh, man, you, you'd love this as, a, as another uh, herp nerd. I caught a big, like, six-something foot uh, sand monitor oh. at this place called Tum National Park. Yeah, a wild sand monitor, and it was just, just a beauty and pretty feisty. But I did, like, this educational video. I'm holding this big, you know, 15-something pound lizard and just, like, oh. Like, that was the first monitor I'd ever caught in the wild, and they are so fun to work with in captivity and even more fun in the wild. Um and yeah, I caught some other neat snakes and lizards and, and some, some amphibians and uh, just had a lot of fun with it. Oh, man. That's awesome. Oh, man. I really want to check that out. I'm going to check out those older YouTube videos. That's great. Yeah. It's a trip, man. You, you, yeah, you'll get a kick out of it. I don't know how many of them up are in Australia, but I've got, I mean, a couple years later, I was in Costa Rica. I think I've got some Tanzania ones up maybe because uh, I did another semester abroad in Tanzania doing the ecology, wildlife conservation uh, semester just focusing mostly on, on wildlife ecology and conservation and we were going to all kinds of different national parks and private reserves and that kind of thing and so I made and my, my big project there was to make an educational video which was part of the course but also I wanted to use that footage to just educate and you know uh, get people excited about animals too. That's awesome did you make it to the Masai Mara in Kenya? Um, I didn't no I didn't I was in uh, in northern Tanzania which is not far from there so I was in like Serengeti and Gorgor Crater uh, Lake Manyara, Tarangari, and, and like I said, some other uh, private reserves, and um, yeah, man, beautiful, beautiful part of the world, really special. I mean, that's that was the first time I was ever in Africa. That was 2007. Wow. I um, when I went to Africa the first time, I felt like I wanted just to leave everything behind and pack up and just leave, like live there the rest of my life. I loved it. Right? It's incredible. So I'm assuming that was in that was in Masai Mara. Or? Yep, yep, the Masai Mara. I've done that a few times back in 2012. I wanted to drop everything, and then anyway, I'm, yeah. So it just I loved it. I felt like I was home. It sounds so cheesy, but it's just when you're in Africa, it's like this innate sense, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, and especially I think for us, it's so as, a, as somebody from North America, it's 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 a far out land. It's so exotic, and it's you know we put it on a pedestal for good reason. I mean, Africa, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, is home to some of the most iconic wildlife in the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's yeah, for, for animal people like us, that's kind of a certainly one one form of a mecca, a yeah. special place. So, what animal were you most excited to see in Africa in the wild? Oh man, um, I mean, the first time I went, like. I mean, seeing those big mega carnivores, and I've always been a big hyena fan, so seeing those in the wild. Dude. And rhino. Yeah. Hyenas yeah. all the way. I'm so, you're the first person I met who was excited about hyenas. No way. Oh, they're so underrated. I mean, they're just such fascinating animals. And when you see them up close, and I've gotten to work even closer with them since then, and man, just seeing those big, early muscular heads and their big teeth. I mean, their teeth, you know, they, they, you know their size is like a, a big dog, right? Kind of built a little differently. They got the big necks and shoulders and, and they're not anatomically quite the same. But man, when you see their teeth, their molars are like this big, dude. I mean, they're just, they're just freaking gnarly in that bite force. I mean, I just find them fascinating. I, um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's nice to meet another hyena fan. Man. Dude, that's I, super yeah, like, and I got on, I will have to honestly send you the link. We just had on uh, one of the top hyena researchers from the, um, oh my God, what is her name? Oh, Dr. Kay Holkamp. She's been like hyenas for 30 years in the Mara. She lives with them. We just had her on the show and I was so starstruck. And yeah, but they're so cool and so fascinating. So I'm so happy. Now, hold on. 
one animal I did not see was a leopard. Did you see a leopard? I did. I saw my uh, first leopard in uh, Serengeti. Nice. Nice. During the day, and it's nice. yeah, I've seen a few nice. since then, some in South Africa and some other countries. But man, that's a special animal. So leopards to me are also special because, um, and you know, the more you talk to Africans about it too, I mean, they really are just the ultimate predator. And so I've always had a, a fascinating. I mean, my my interest in animals really was heavy with reptiles, but also just carnivores of any type. I just found really fascinating. Um, you know, when you're talking about an animal that is as fast and strong and stealthy and has multiple forms of weapons is like, I mean, it's, it is the ultimate predator. I mean, really, they're just, and it's translated to our house cats. I mean, that's why house cats are so destructive to wildlife around the world because they're such efficient little predators. Um, and so the, uh, their relatives, the leopards, are like one of the most fascinating animals. Uh, and to answer your question about animals, I'm excited about, I mean, of course, reptiles too. I mean, I was dying to see some. I mean, I love venomous snakes. I mean, those are those have always been one of my top favorite animals. Crocodilians as well. So seeing you know big Nile crocodiles was super exciting. Um, I was looking for venomous snakes everywhere. I saw a uh, I saw a black mamba in Botswana. Um, uh, at the so at, at the end of that semester, I did some traveling in South Africa, Botswana, and Zambia with my dad actually. Uh, and so that was really neat. I saw some cool reptiles in, in, in Tanzania as well, some cool snakes. Nothing super – I don't know why I didn't see as many venomous snakes at that time. But I, I met some in captivity, which was pretty cool. I got to hang out with a boom slang. And I did see a wild boom slang. Really? I tried to catch a thing. By the way, it has a big, like, six-plus-foot um, boom slang. And they're such cute snakes. You know, they their venom is frightening. You know, you bleed to death over the course of a few days or a week or so. Which is pretty scary, and there's not there's not a lot of anti venom maybe anywhere uh, for those guys. But they have such cute little mousy faces and big eyes, and they they look so not menacing and adorable for a snake. Yet they have this like awful slow death venom, which is so intriguing to me, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean the reptiles too. You know, Africa has got its fair share. They do. Did you see an African rock python? Um, not in the wild, man. Which kind of broke my heart. Oh my god, dude! I was just in Uganda. Okay, I was doing some giraffe uh, translocation work, and I can go into that too. But um, I, our group split up, and some of us were going to look for um, the shoebill stork, which is huge on my list as as a bird. I've always you just wanted to see in the wild. I mean, they look like these dinosaur robots, you know. Um, and then uh, the other group went to look for some collared giraffes, and they wanted to get some. Some some uh, some some location uh, coordinates on them, uh, and they ran into a ten or no, I'd say it was actually over twelve foot, over twelve foot. I can comfortably say that rock python, and I was like, oh my god, I would have died. Like I wanted to just jump out. I would have jumped out and just you know definitely caught that thing, and it would have been a trip. And one of the guys actually, one of the videographers did. And, uh, man, the thing, he couldn't get, you know, but couldn't like fully handle it. The thing was so snappy, but oh, I mean, I would have died. I mean, what a dream. I would have died too. And you know what? Those big snakes are rare these days because those locals will just kill them on sight. So it's great to, you know what I mean? To find them. It's just like, it oh my God. I can't like me more, dude. And, and what you say that, and that applies really to other parts of the world too. I mean, trying to find, you know, a big reticulate python is a lot more challenging these days than it used to be. And even, even you know, you go to the New World and you, you want to find a big anaconda, you have to go, you, you have to get deep into the bush to, to see some of those big guys. And some of the protected areas you can see. I saw an 11 or 12 foot anaconda once in, in Ecuador. That was, that was nice to see. Um, but uh, it's, it is, you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So back under the hyenas, then we'll stop that. But when I was interviewing Dr. K. Holcamp, they came across a rock python that had eaten a full-grown adult hyena, a female. Damn. Oh my God. Can you That's believe unreal. in the Mara? No. And she didn't believe it. And one of the students was like, she showed the video evidence that, or the pictures, and yeah, rock python took out a female hyena. Wait, they had the actual predatory event like happen. Yeah, no, like they came across it and she was swallowing a hyena. And Dr. Oh, Dr. K was like, no way. And the researcher was like, yes, like this happened. And I was like, and my mouth dropped. I'm like, wait, what? Like, yeah, absolutely. So they are. Yeah, that surprises me too, to be honest. I wonder if that hyena was just on her way out because, hy I mean, the bite of a hyena, I mean, they can fracture a giraffe's femur. You know, if, if that hyena got a bite on that snake. 
I don't think that snake would want to play anymore. Yeah. You know, so that's I never heard of that either. You, you don't see those big snakes eat big carnivores so too often. Yeah, and Dr. You know? Yeah, and I'll, I'll send you the link. But Dr. Holcamp was like, "That's complete nonsense." The researchers like, "No, it happened." And they, yeah, and she she confirmed it. And I thought I've never heard of that in my life. I mean, you hear of the meat and gazelles, but not like a large predator like that. Right. So. Yep. No, exactly. No, I'm 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 with you. I, I would have had to see it, seen it to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Awesome. Okay, so you I, you you just have a dream right now. Of course, you have your Animal Planet show. Evan goes wild. Was that just like a dream come true? Because you've been filming since 2006. Was it just like finally, finally? I mean, absolutely. I couldn't describe it any better. I mean, it was I was getting to work with wildlife. And some domesticated animals around the world. You know, we're going to Southeast Asia and, and, and Sri Lanka and, and Africa and South America. And I and, uh, went to Mexico. I mean, we, oh, my God, dude. It was just, I mean, I'm getting to work with leopards and, and elephants and crocodiles and snakes and monitors and binturongs and mm. swim with whales. Mm. And I mean, the list goes on, man. It was just absolutely epic. It was, I mean, that was something, I mean, that's, that's, in 2006, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have my Animal Planet show, and you know, to share the my you know the love of animals and wildlife and, and everything with the world. And, um, you know, it's been something I've been working towards since graduating vet school. Many times, I've worked with many different producers. I've had production deals with networks. I've like gotten this close, you know, several times, and it's just so hard to get that to finally happen. And when it does, it's absolutely epic. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was. That was everything you can imagine it would be for somebody like me. I was very excited. Yeah, and when did that – so how long – because a lot of people are probably wondering, how long does it take to film a show like that? Like, How many episodes did you film, like eight, ten? Yes, eight episodes exactly. Okay. Um, and each episode was in a different country, except for the last two. Seven and eight were both in Peru, but they were really different ecosystems. So episode seven was in the Amazon. And then we traveled to like Sacred Valley, Machu Picchu, and we did more of the like cloud forests and and uh, the mountains in that area. So it's a bit different. But um, every other episode is a different country on its own. So when you film a show like that, like yeah, I mean you have to dedicate at least, including traveling, you know, six to seven days per episode. You know, sometimes a little more, but usually it's about six to seven. So we filmed all that um, in three months, and I had to fit a ten-day Spain trip in the middle of that. So I, I literally was home for 36 hours, give or take a little bit at a time, every couple of weeks for about three months straight, just like, just constantly gone, just constantly. That's just how it was. Um, but we had, we had, we had some tight, a tight schedule. And so we weren't able to space it out and, you know, have a little longer breaks. So our whole team was just busting ass for three months straight. And that, I mean, most, you know, I had to do some, you know, some uh, outtake, you know, kind of footage, and we would, we would, you know, go to Malibu and pretend like we're in, you know, Kenya, <laughs> and talk just to kind of get the story straight. Just you know, if you know things they missed in the episode, or they want to like tie in some loose loose ends, you know. So we, I would do that, you know, maybe once a week for the next couple of months while they were in post. But the post team had a lot of work to do. I mean, that was where the the production team and the network were still very very busy, and I was also busy um, not with uh, doing the show per se, but doing a lot of media promoting the show. So I was traveling all over uh, the U.S. to do, you know, going to New York and other states to to just promote the show and do some talk shows and that kind of thing. Yeah. So is there pressure when you finally sign this deal with Animal Planet? You're doing a show now. It's actually happening. Are you like, oh crap? Like, okay, so we have to actually go find these animals. Is there like a lot of pressure, or is it helpful having guides? Like, what is that process like? Yeah, no. So, the, our production team was uh, amazing, and um, they they brought a lot of stories to the table by just doing their diligent research and connecting with amazing conservationists and veterinarians. And some of them actually was I was just connecting with on social media and that kind of thing. And then we would kind of put those together. And so a lot of the animals we worked with were in captivity or in the care of a wildlife rescue or whatnot. Uh, and then we would look for, you know, native wildlife as well. And, and some of those were, you know, just luck of the draw. I mean, you know how wildlife is. You've been around the world. You know what it's like to, you, you know that you can go out and you might not see anything for days or weeks. It's just the absolute nature of it. And, you know, that's that's the beauty of it, too. When you do see it, it makes it that much more rewarding. But some of my favorite segments and, and, and moments and encounters were not in any way planned or expected at all. Like, you know, I, I caught a... Um, 
this gorgeous big like uh, you know six feet or so maybe a little longer um, Asian water monitor and it was it was in the Philippines and there was a, a subspecies endemic to the island of Palawan which is this long skinny island in the western uh, Philippines and so this subspecies is only found on Palawan and um, it's uh, it's a beautiful animal and and, and you know, I, I it was it was hanging out by this village and apparently eating some of the chickens and stuff. So we wanted to kind of grab it, and relocate it, and I ended up doing some minor, minor veterinary work on it too. It had a little ulceration on its lip, but uh, you know, I caught that guy, and dude, you can't plan that. Yeah, you can't. You know, yeah. that was it was a total adventure. I mean, we I was with my cameraman, and uh, luckily, and I just put my backpack down. I was like, you guys follow me, like follow me. And so this lizard was somewhat habituated, so like it was used to people, so it wasn't quite as skittish. I mean, but once I got within a few feet, it was like, okay, you're you're too close, buddy. And it went out sprinting. I sprinted right behind her, and then got her tail. And my cameraman's coming around the corner of this uh, this like structure, and you see the lizard just like spinning around and trying to bite my face and everything. <laughs> it was nuts. But um, anyways, yeah. So some of it's luck of the draw, and uh, we got we have a lot of good connections. I'm really dialed in with a lot of conservationists and vets around the world too. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's doing your research. I mean, the same thing goes like when I would do these trips by myself and I'd be, you know, looking for wildlife in you know Costa Rica or Cambodia or wherever I was. Um, I was always doing research and trying to, you know, communicate to people or reach out to wildlife rescue, see if I can volunteer there, talk to people in the parks and get some tips on, oh, where can I find this animal? Where can I find that? Like, what's, mm -hmm. what's good there? Because mm -hmm. a lot of what I was doing was just truly wild, you know, working with wildlife and just getting out. And I get lucky sometimes. Sometimes I wouldn't. Um, over the years, I think I'm very lucky because I've gotten to see and work with a lot of truly wild animals and get them on camera and, and talk about, you know, how fascinating they are. But, uh, you know, it's, it's about doing your research before you go out there. But when you have a whole production team, you know, it makes life a lot easier. Yeah. And where is your favorite place to film? Is that too hard of a question? That is, man. I mean, I, a lot of places are special to me. There's a lot of African countries that are really special to me. Um, what's tough for a lot of uh, sub-Saharan African countries is that you can't really just go out and do it on your own, which I really like to do. You really need to be with people that know what they're doing or have a guide uh, just because of safety from other people, which is honestly by far to me much scarier than the wildlife there. But the wildlife is a legitimate concern. You can't go trekking at night looking for crocodiles in Uganda because there are hippos. And that is not an animal you want to come across. And they're very terrestrial at night. And I mean, whether it's day or night, there's always other wildlife and super dangerous. So... Um, that makes Africa complicated in that way. So, like, I mean, I love Southeast Asia. You know, I mean, that, that wildlife is so exotic for someone, you know, it's from the U.S. You know, they have, you know, Viveridae, which is a genus of animals. And we have nothing like binturongs and genets and civets. And, you know, Africa has, has Viveridae too, but that's an old world genus that you don't even see anything like. And in, in the, in the, the, when it comes to venomous snakes, you know, their diversity of elapids is unreal. I mean, they have cobras. You know, they have the craziest stuff in crates and all this super neat wildlife and some of the prettiest vipers I've ever seen or worked with in my life. Like, so, for instance, I mean, one of my favorites is Indonesia. You know, for a reptile guy, I got to tell you, man, Komodo Island was one of my oh. most reptile experiences of my life for the obvious reason that there's Komodo dragons, the biggest lizard in the world. I love monitors as it is. And these big, you know, 120 to 150 pound dragons are just roaming the land. Um, but I'll tell you, man, in a 24-hour period, I was there for a few days. So I made a deal with the rangers. I stayed in one of their you know, basic huts, ate rice and beans with them every day because um, I just wanted to get as much. I just wanted to get as, everything I could out of Komodo. Um, within a 24-hour period, I caught two spinning cobras. Wow. I caught uh, a, a green tree viper. I caught another couple of colubrids. Um, and then... Uh, so obviously saw tons of lizards and other wildlife, but man, I mean, that place is riddled. Oh, I uh, almost got this uh, Timor python. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it was on the roof of a ranger station. And so I'm literally, I'm scaling up the side of it, and I'm just in range to grab the thing. I'm, I'm on top of a horizontal roof slat. So I'm on the roof, like inside the wall uh, of the house, but under the, like, it says, say the roof's like here, like an A-frame, mm -hmm. and then the ceiling's mm -hmm. here. I'm kind of in this area. Inside the roof, on the A-frame, about 10, 9 and a half, 10 feet from the floor, 
on this thing and trying to grab it up in the roof, the freaking board breaks under me. Oh. And I just fall to the ground, land on my feet, which I, to this day I don't know how that happened, and walk out the front door and the damn snake got away. <laughs> but it was such a trip, man. It was like a six foot, just beautiful, beautiful python. Um, but yeah, that's so. Indo is great too because I, I, the more I've traveled, I've gained a bigger appreciation for avian life. And so I've always thought birds were neat. Um, but man, when you see some of those exotic birds and you get to see some of these crazy looking hornbills and even some of the little birds, it's just unreal. And then if you're into primates, I mean, they've got a greater ape, you know, they've yeah. got the, the orangutan. They've got proboscis monkeys, which are so weird. I got to see tarsiers for the first time in my life in Indonesia. And then there are obviously covered cats and, and all kinds of other neat species. But it's if you're into primates or birds or reptiles or diving, which is – I'd love to dive. And of all these places I go to, for the most part, have at least some pretty solid diving, if not world-renowned. And so if you can put all those things in one place, Indonesia is really special. Uh, Brazil is incredible. That wildlife, I, for new world wildlife, like, uh, I don't know if, you know, if you've ever been there or heard of the Pantanal, but it's, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the Pantanal, and it's like the Everglades on crack, you know, it's, you know, I'm seeing anchors and anacondas and capybaras, and I was there in the dry season, so, which was, which was cool. Um, I mean, both wet season's cool, too, but the dry school, because everything's so concentrated. So I'm going to these ponds where there's literally, I mean, it's not a big pond, you know, maybe a couple hundred meters by a hundred meters, and I'm seeing like, you know, 400 caimans, wow. uh, you, you caimans sitting in there. I mean, it's just covered in reptiles, too. Um, that was cool. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and in Africa, man, South Africa, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to choose, man. It's yeah. hard to choose. <laughs> Did you see jaguars? Um, not on that trip. I worked with jaguars in the show, actually, uh, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. I got to work with mm-hmm. a, a three-month-old black jaguar cub, which was like, Oh my God, just rocked my world. And then I got to work with a seven year old female that we had to anesthetize. That was actually an exciting story because she woke up earlier, started waking up earlier than I wanted her to. And we had to do some diagnostic workup on her, get a good look at her. And one of the things I really wanted to do was look in her mouth. And she woke up before we could do that. And she started kind of opening her eyes, and moving her head. And we had to bail like immediately. But I saw that she was still waking up. So we, so we had to bail. She's on a tarp. We carried her back into the holding enclosure. And we're like, you know, that was close. Um, I see she's still waking up kind of slowly, and her mouth is towards the door. And so I had to, I had to sneak back in there. And I'm like, just, I've got a foot out the door, and I'm just like, just going in, just looking at her lips, trying to spread her mouth apart before she just, you know, lays into me or whatever. But I was fine. Everything worked out fine. But that was pretty scary. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the new world version of the leopard. Yeah. You know, and they get even bigger, and they can swim, and they can climb. And they're fast, and they're strong as hell, and they've got the claws. I mean, they're they're the new world's ultimate predator, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I just saw some behind the scenes recently, and it was just like, ooh, up close. I mean, you know, it just gets your heart going. I mean, the way they look at you, and there's just, you know, it's like, man, that's a fearsome predator. I mean, you know, it's just, yeah, apex predator. Yeah. Animals to the That's, max, yeah. <laughs> it really it is. There it is, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of a random question. I've never been to Asia I am always so nervous, Evan, that I'm going to like walk into one of those markets where I see like lizards hanging or snakes hanging or turtles for sale for food. Have you encountered it like stuff like that going to these foreign countries? And how, do, how have you dealt with that? Because that would, I don't know, man. I, I, uh, I that, yeah. Um, uh, it's tough. You know, I'm, I, I've been so desensitized to all the tragedies in the wildlife and animal and the domestic animal world because you the more you travel the first time you see those things you know it's uh it's traumatic and it's so sad and you just seeing street dogs man and street cats it just it's going to break your heart and you want to help every single one of them and then you see more and then you see little pet turtles for sale in a little container this big or you see dead turtles for sale or you see sharks for sale or shark fins or monkey parts or whatever the hell and it's um it's really frustrating because you feel so helpless because you're like what what can i do what can i do right now what can i i mean I, i'm not I, what i want to do that's going to get me arrested i don't want to go to jail in thailand you know or or, or korea you know or vietnam like that's that doesn't sound like a good idea so um 
I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you, dude. I mean, it's it's just the more you see, the more used to it you get, and that's why I try to raise awareness about it when I, you know, when I when I'm you know doing a social media or even TV or media of any kind. I try to discuss it and just get the awareness out there because so many people that aren't in the animal world like us just have no idea that you know rhinos are being killed for their horn or gorillas are being killed for their hands or sharks are being finned for their you know fins and all that all that stuff so it's uh it's not easy though it's not fun you know i mean those are the animals we've always grown up and loved and appreciated you know uh, wholeheartedly and then you see them just treated like a commodity and it's kind of brutal yeah well i'm happy you are raising awareness sorry i didn't mean to like make this interview depressing i just was curious because i've seen some i mean <laughs> I've seen some, i mean listen if you yeah. see the animal world if that's an interest of yours and i know it is of yours personally but to anybody listening if, if you guys are into the animal world you're going to see dark stuff you know, there's a lot of tragedy. There just is. And, and the more you learn and the more you delve into it and the more you explore and see, the, the more tragedy you realize there is. And so, I mean, there's points where I just feel like overwhelmed. I feel like, what can I do? It almost feels futile at times because things are happening at such a fast and scary rate with how we're losing wildlife uh, and, and, their, and their wild habitats. And so it can be really scary at times. But... Um, I mean, you can't you can't let that stop you from what you're doing. You can't let it stop your appreciation. And you just have to, you know, if, you know, the way we, myself and a lot of the conservationists look at it is, I mean, listen, if we don't do anything, they have zero chance. You know, we know things don't look good. We know this might not work out in our favor. We know we might lose these animals in the next, you know, anywhere from a year to 15 years, depending on the species. Um, but uh, we're not going to go down without a fight, so we, we've got to just stick with our passion, stick with our guns and do everything we think we can and, and stay positive and, and, you know, focus on the positives when, when positive things do happen, which they do. It's not bad every day. There's a lot of really beautiful things that happen too. And so you, you just can't forget those things. Yeah. And I, that's why I love, you know, you having the show and then your massive Instagram following. It's great. That's a great audience. And you're able to use social media, which I think is really helped us, you know, get the message out there. So yeah. I, I think it's awesome. Thank so, you so much, man. And, yeah, social media is one of those things where it's – I still worry that it does more harm than it does good when it comes to wildlife conservation, unfortunately. But when there's people like, like yourself or, you know, the kind of work that I do, we can promote, you know, animals the right way and conservation the right way. Um, that's, that's super important. So, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for the work that you do and the guests that you have on and, and you know, the, the enthusiasm and excitement and knowledge that you share – is super important. I mean, that really is, you know, and you have a huge listening base. I mean, I've, I've been familiar with your podcast for a couple of years and I know you've been doing it for a while and, and just seeing you get out and so many kids too. I mean, that's, that's one of the most valuable things that we can do for animals is exactly what you're doing and getting kids that generation excited about it. And you're doing a killer job, man. So, so keep it up, man. Thanks. Well, you too, obviously you're killing it. And I'm sure, or have you already started filming season two of Evan Goes Wild or is that in the when do you start that? No, I'm working on some other projects now. Unfortunately, we're not doing a season two with, with that specific show, but we've got some other projects that we're working on, and I, I think we're going to be able to do some really neat stuff. Okay. But, uh, yeah, no, that was my last wildlife show. We'll, we'll be back. We'll be back for more. <laughs> okay. Now, Evan, okay, so hold on. You're, you're doing all this stuff. You're traveling the world. I mean, are you really at the vet hospital, though? Like, I mean, you're, you're so busy. Like, how can you do it? Like, how can you do all this? <laughs> Yeah, it's impossible, right? I mean, there's just not enough hours in the day or days in the week, you know. So uh, I'm very part time. I mean, in October, um, you know, the last couple of months, really, I haven't been in hardly at all. You know, I mean, I was in Uganda and South Africa and Jordan um, for most of the last couple of months. So I haven't been able to get in. So I mean, there are months when I can get in. I'm still I'm part time no matter what because I do so much traveling and media, and I have other products I'm working on. Um, and so, um, part time these days, you know, uh, it's like, you know, eight days a month, give or take sometimes more, sometimes less, often less. Um, and, uh, you know, the first like four and a half, four year, four and a half years, I was there full time five, five, you know, big long days a week. And I did overnights for, I do four overnights in a row once a month, uh, every month of the first year I was working there. So I, I got some really incredible experience and I loved it. Um, I do love what I'm doing now. I love having this, uh, just the, the, the diversity of kind of the work that I'm doing. I get to film and I get to come back to the hospital and I kind of get the best of both worlds. So I don't get overwhelmed with one or the other. You know, I kind of get to do a little bit of everything, which, you know, that's, 
I couldn't ask for a better situation. To be honest, I, I wouldn't change my profession or my life with anybody's. I love it. I love, and I love having this variety too. So how many people call the office on a daily basis and say, hey, my my cat has fleas or can I talk to I – mean, just some pet problem. Can I you know, schedule an appointment with Dr. Anton? Does that happen all the time? I'm sure it does, right? I don't think I, yeah, I mean – I get it. I get I get messages for sure on a regular basis, at least a couple, a few a week or something. But you know, I'd have to ask the front staff. You know, honestly, they're the ones who take all those calls, so I, I have no idea. Um, but uh, yeah, we've had some interesting uh, visits and calls and whatnot over the years. <laughs> oh, you know what? You are. I we've never had someone on the show who's been named the sexiest, you know, person or vet. Is that okay? First of all, because you have a fiance, correct? Yeah. Is that hard for her? You know, I think I, I'm so lucky. She is, um, she's very supportive and very mellow. She's not the jealous type and she's confident in our relationship and everything. So it's, it's not an issue luckily, but I mean, there are, I've dated girls where that would be, I mean, there's no way we would survive something like that. So yeah, I know. I mean, that's been, you know, I, just, I was first called that, you know, five, five years ago. So yeah, she can handle that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Do you get like creepy messages from people from around the world? Do you get like pictures and like weird stuff that like, you know what I'm talking just, about? Oh yeah. <laughs> Dude, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you start like having more followers on social media, you'll start, you'll start seeing some more of that for sure. Wow. And you just, okay. Well, hopefully you're able to censor some of that. Cause that just could probably be overwhelming at sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not asking for it or whatever, but uh, honestly, the way I look at it is there's so many other bigger things to be concerned about. It's, it doesn't really bother me so much. There's, I could show you a lot more gnarly things in the animal world that would rock your boat a bit more than a pic from somebody that you never wanted to see. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. What is, what is your favorite animal to work with in veterinary medicine? Oh, man. Um, oh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a tough one, dude. I mean, there's so many things to love about so many different animals. I mean, I love, I love working with huge animals. Like I've gotten to work with rhinos a lot more over the last couple of years and working with these big, gentle giants up close and personal has been very rewarding and fun and just super special. I love working with them. Um, and you know, you just learn what sensitive little animals there. And I have a big heart for them too, because I think, uh, you know, there's still not quite enough awareness around the world going on with what's happening with them, with their, with their horns, you know, them being killed for their horns for the illegal black market in, in China and Southeast Asia. Um, but they're, they're super special. And so that's, that's definitely up there. And, you know, another big animal that, you know, I think everybody loves is the elephant. And when you do get to work with one up close and personal and, and almost, form like a, you know, a bond or a friendship or relationship with them where you, where you get to know them a little bit. Those have been some of my most you know, special, emotional, rewarding moments in my veterinary career. And then of course, you know, I love the dangerous guys. I love working with crocs. I love working with venomous snakes. I love working with monitors. I mean, you know, working with a wild monitor, even a captive monitor is a blast to me. I mean, they're just such, they're like these little Godzillas. They got these claws and they're so neat and they're just all muscle. And so, uh, yeah, man, I, I can't I can't just pick one, but those are those are some that stick out, I guess. Yeah, I have a savanna monitor. I have I have two alligators, and I love them like my kids. I mean, just you know what I mean. I mean, they're like ten and a half feet, but I mean, I can't really hug them. But it's just like ah, you know. So that's a trip, man. Yeah. So with your with your alligators, um, do they live indoors or outdoors? So we're actually gonna I'm gonna talk to you. I need to enlist your help. We're gonna be moving them soon. So. <laughs> I uh, know uh, that's kind of a joke, but so our large male Sonny, he lives outdoors. He's 10 and a half feet and he lives outdoors. We have natural geothermal water. We live along the snake river in Idaho. Oh, that's cool. Yep. There's some spots in Colorado with, with, with crocodilians that do that. Yep. That's yep. super neat. Yep. And then our female chomper, she's six and a half feet. She lives indoors. And these, but by the way, for those of you listening who don't know, these are all rescues. So they're not just like pets I got. So Sonny was living in someone's bedroom. Chompers was given some guy gave, uh, some guy gave his fiance chompers as a, um, anniversary present. And so long story short, they broke up and that's how I ended up with chompers. But yeah. Well, good on you. 
taking those guys in. It's usually a sad story, especially for those big alligators. Yeah, um, yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, no, I love love crocodilians. Absolutely love them. So do you, you have an outdoor space? Is it just like open air kind of thing? It's open air. And then right now, Evan, you have to check out my Instagram. We're building a large alligator building basically the tanks like 38 feet long it's a thousand square feet it's like looks like a cabin like my wife and i want to move into it they have a better view of the river than we do but uh yeah it's really cool that's incredible dude how many gallons of water will be in that Ooh, that's a good question i don't even, even know yet i don't even know yet no but it's 38 feet long 10 feet or 12 feet wide and six seven feet deep Say that. Wait. Say it again. It's thirty. Are you Are you going to do the math for me? This is great. Uh, no, I just <laughs> good actually. <laughs> no, I'm just, I don't know. If you know that. Uh, okay. That's uh, that's there. So if you take the dimensions, so 30, the inch dimension, and multiply the length by height by width. Yeah. Uh, but and then multiply those inches together, and then divide it by one thirty one. You get a rough idea of the gallon. It's like a little aquarium trip. So you said. 30, 38 feet long 38 feet long so that's 456 inches okay uh around 12 feet wide okay so 144 and then i would say let's just say nine ten feet deep i think you say times 120 to be on the safe side so that's seven almost eight million that's almost sixty thousand gallons that's sixty thousand gallons oh i love that's about that. what i Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, Evan, I had to take – I got a biology degree. I had to take all that math class. I don't remember a darn thing, dude. I <laughs> No, I'm so bad I'm just, with math. <laughs> I, I, I got through calculus, um, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God. And I, I, I'm a big – I'm like a math – that comes naturally to me, luckily. So I, 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 I didn't mind it. You know, I, I like learning some of that stuff, but uh, I do not remember it all. Yeah. Um, well, that's incredible, dude. So is it going to be like a concrete base – like, are you building, are you filling it with concrete or how you, what is, so, what is the actual the, the bottom of the pool going to be? So it's actually fiberglass. You're going to love this. This is an old recycled water tower from a tiny town in Idaho, Atlanta, Idaho. They sawed that it is, in half. Oh, cool. <laughs> so we put it in uh, the ground. Yeah. Uh, you know? That thick? Like that thick? It's like, uh, I mean, to hold that much water. To hold that much water. Yeah. It's huge. And it. <laughs> I know, and we were trying to figure out something to do because, you know, Sonny's getting bigger, and it was, it's like, what are we going to do? These pools are... You can clean easily. I mean, that's going to be so easy to work with. Yeah. yeah. And that's going to, and you can work around it and get some, I'm sure you get some plants and whatnot in there and some yeah. substrate or whatnot. Yeah. And we have 13 windows. I love, like, yeah. Love, so, so I, I look at containers for the same reasons for, you know, thinking animal enclosure ideas and big, and it's big water storage tanks. Yeah, and you see them online, and they're just big. You know, for for I, I still want to do this, build a sensory deprivation chamber. You know what those are? Yeah, I know exactly. I think Joe Rogan talks about them. Yes, he's podcast. all about those. Um, and uh, I was like, man, they're so expensive, but they're so big. How can I customize this to my needs, really space wise, as much as anything? Because they're so big. And I was looking into. It, I was like, dude, I get a water container, and you can get yeah. these big water containers, and you know create your own lid out of it and do your pumps and drill everything in and they're plastic so it's easy to work with and yeah. I, I, I was just looking at stuff like that last night man like no joke that's so Love crazy that stuff. hold on evan i'm gonna go show you really quick let me go, let me go grab my phone i have to show you a photo just give me one sec yeah give me one yeah, sec please one sec so cool but yeah we got the full on this is full on you see it look at this I'm watching it right now you got it all dug out dude this is incredible yeah i'm <laughs> seeing Look at that thing. Yeah, that is huge. I love this picture. That's, <laughs> that's it. Amazing. That's that's what I wanted to show you. <laughs> okay, there we go. I can't. Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, it's rounded, so maybe it's you know it's fifty thousand gallons. But dude, these are going to be some happy, lucky alligators, man. They got a bridge. Yeah. Dude, this is badass. Yeah. This is then, super cool. And it looks like a cat. I gotta come now. see. The pool, man. You're more than welcome this to. Is a yeah, it's thank serious. you, dude. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch the rest, yeah. dude. I'm telling you, I love that stuff. That's great. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to get sidetracked, but uh, yeah. So yeah, we're doing that. We're moving them soon, so that should be interesting. But yeah, we put a cabin structure over it now. We're gonna have outdoor areas where they're gonna be able to go outdoors and stuff like that. So good for you, man. That's yeah. that's the way to rescue alligators. And so that's what I was saying. I, I thought we were live, so I was just didn't want to kill any you know dead air. And so I was you know saying to your viewers something I'm sure you've done a million times, and just reiterating. Then you know crocodiles and the alligators are are not good pets. 
they need a lot of space. You know, some of them get to be very big, and American alligators are one of the bigger crocodilian species, and we've seen them get to be, you know, 17 plus feet long, so they can be huge. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, just so people know, because it's sad, because you see those babies, and you can get them for 50 or 100 bucks at a reptile show, and you're like, oh, so cool, I have an alligator, and it's like, oh, dude, like, yeah. you realize this needs the room of a house, like a big room. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. Anyway, so back on to you. I know we're almost at the hour. Evan, where do you see yourself in 10 years? To be honest, I would love to be doing more or less than I'm doing now, just on a bigger scale. I'd love to have a wildlife show still. I'd love to continue what I'm doing on social. I'd love to keep promoting wildlife um, and get back even more and raise more awareness and just do everything on a bigger scale. But I'm, I'm just kind of continuing to work and strive and climb in the direction I'm going and doing a lot of the same stuff I'm doing, to tell you the truth. That's awesome. Do you have any advice for anyone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Yeah, you know, I get asked that a lot. Um, and so my best advice, especially if you do want to work with like, I work with, you know, I work with a lot of dogs and cats and domestics, but if you, you're looking to work with wildlife too, uh, you know, this is something that starts at the local level. You know, you don't have to travel to Indonesia or Africa, you know, like the things that we've done to go see and, and do these things. Um, my first wildlife experience was in, and not until college, you know, a lot of people start before then, but it was at my local wildlife rescue. You know, it was at uh, the Greenwood Wildlife uh, Rehab Sanctuary in, in Colorado, near where I went to undergrad at University of Colorado Boulder. And start there, man. Start local. I mean, we, our, our, our native wildlife, you know, where we live, anywhere in the world, there's, there's some fascinating animals there. And I, I love the animals I grew up with in Kansas. I loved what there was in Colorado. I love what there was in California. Like, you know, start there. And that will give you, uh, you know, get your feet wet and what wildlife conservation and wildlife rescue and whatnot looks like. Um, you know, and do your research. You know, go out there. Get out there and connect with people. And if you do travel, when I would travel internationally, I would connect with other rescues or conservationists or people and, and just meet more. And the more you know, the more you know, dialed in you are, and the, the more you can do. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I would hope to have you come back again, maybe in a year or so. Let us know what you're doing. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Right. Well, right back at you, man. It was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for having me, Corbin. Keep up the good work, dude. Yeah, and if you're ever in Idaho, I swear to you, it's, yeah, please come see our alligators. Yeah. Thank you up on that, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Evan.